Welcome to a series entitled The Thanatonic Phenomenon. Over the last few videos, we've been summarizing the views of philosopher Jean-Luc Marion, covering his uh, phenomenology of givenness, moving through them according to different principles. Today, we're going to address a couple of the criticisms that I have been leveled against this phenomenology. And then we're going to finish with my own set of questions in light of the work I'm building towards. The advances made by this phenomenology of givenness offer opportunities to address phenomena often excluded. The other remarkable feature of this phenomenology is that it continues to respect a circumscribed legitimacy for all established modes of thought that have preceded it, except to the point that they infringe upon the rights of other modes of thought. Making that exception, however, is no small gesture. Many challenges faced today may be attributed to such infringements. Nature and humanity notably bear the consequences when the object is the standard of knowledge. Environmental degradation, for example, is a byproduct of viewing nature as an object. At the same time, the very origins of the problem are used as the means to attempt to solve it, such as if we could only develop cleaner fuels or tax people for carbon em emissions, etc. Similarly, approaching interiority as a common law phenomenon and deploying therapeutic interventions consistent with this orientation, though effective in alleviating symptoms in the short term, leaves a smokescreen of bandages over the veneer of still gaping wounds. To behold nature and our humanity as saturated phenomena would require reformulating the pervasive collective and personal wounds of our time and possibly inaugurate a renewed approach to them, one that doesn't deploy solutions that simply repeat the problem. Nonetheless, this phenomenology is not without criticisms. I conclude the summary of Marianne's phenomenology of givenness by addressing and responding to the two most common ones. One, the role of hermeneutics, and two, the theological status of this phenomenology. Examining these criticisms here is necessary to the degree they may be leveled against the present work I'm building toward as well. In response to this phenomenology of givenness, it's argued that the so-called pure givens belie an unacknowledged and implicit hermeneutics. This is because the appearance of the phenomenon is considered to be always already imbued with meaning given to it by the one who encounters it. This is thought to be a necessary consequence of our finitude and finding ourselves thrown into a world of meaning that structures those appearances. Critical hermeneutics would add that such interpretations are inevitably shaped by power structures and that these produce certain kinds of knowledge that support those structures. This is not to necessarily deny that some hermeneutical approaches account for a kind of otherness, uh, as in the case of diacritical hermeneutics. However, such other otherness is always already in a dialectical play and iterative process of understanding. Bridges of meaning are built through dialogue and narrative understanding that neither totalizes the other nor lets the other remain as an indeterminate radical alterity. Such sensibilities appear on the surface at odds with the proposal for an absolute unconditioned givenness whereby the given takes the initiative to give itself from itself. Though most acknowledge that Marianne incorporates some elements of hermeneutics, it's thought to be restricted to a purely epistemic status. And perhaps in the cases of saturated phenomena, meaning is derived entirely from the phenomenon, rendering the self wholly passive before it. And so we may ask, does the proposal for an unconditioned givenness belie a desire for absolute foundations by denying the role of fundamental hermeneutics? Does Marian in fact restrict interpretation to an epistemic act that merely follows the actual appearing of the phenomenon after it's been fully accomplished independent of any such interpretation? Finally, is the self who encounters the phenomenon rendered an entirely passive recipient of the already completed package? As we'll see, the answers to these questions are not quite as straightforward as it's sometimes portrayed. In a recent essay, Marian has offered his most explicit formulation of hermeneutics to date. In it, he addresses recalcitrant misunderstandings concerning givenness and the status of the given that can be summarized as three distinct conflations. First, the given is conflated with sensible intuition. 
Since being given, Marianne has carefully distinguished them, a move flowing from Husserl's breakthrough that brought an intuition beyond sensibility to include eidetic and categorical intuitions. And elsewhere, Marian has offered examples of givens that lack intuition altogether, because intuition is not equated with givenness. He adds that primary sense data, though seeming to appear immediately, is always mediated by theoretical knowledge, whereas the immediacy of the givens are never given immediately and require a certain kind of mediation to arrive at them. Consequently, Marian supports Seller's argument concerning the myth of the given, insofar as it concerns the empiricist approach to sense data, but for that reason, thinks the concept of the given has not been refuted, merely misunderstood. Second, givenness is conflated with efficient causality. The phenomenological reduction that leads one back to givenness does not produce a phenomenon or construct an object for understanding, just as it does not lead one back to subjective impressions of lived experience. The reduction adds nothing, but instead, through a process of elimination or distillation brings lived experience or the psychological phenomenon back to the unconditioned but indeterminate given. Third, what gives itself is conflated with what shows itself in such a way as to lead to the mistaken conclusion that appearances precede their interpretations or already contain a fully foreign meaning independent of any interpreter. Marianne will spend much of the essay defending the intrinsic necessity of hermeneutics for a phenomenology of givenness one that does not merely function as an epistemic act, but is intrinsic to the appearance of the phenomenon. First, however, Marian does affirm what he has claimed elsewhere. Givenness remains the absolute criterion and de jure authority for the given phenomenon. It fixes the level and degree of the given's actuality and subsumes all class distinctions, such as immanence and transcendence, consciousness and reality, intention and intuition, noema and noesis, etc., leaving nothing outside the scope of givenness. The phenomenological reduction leads the lived experience of the phenomenon back to the originary evidence of the given. All this so far is the standard formulation of this, of, of this phenomenology. Nonetheless, Marianne claims that givenness, rather than prohibiting hermeneutics, requires it, Deploying the phenomenological reduction to arrive at givenness begins with the showing of the phenomenon, an appearance that Marian acknowledges is always already interpreted. Hermeneutics is essential for operating the reduction and even precedes it in lived experience. This reinforces a claim made in an earlier work that givenness functions more as a last principle rather than a first principle in that one arrives at the given after the interpreted phenomenon shows itself. This produces a notable ambiguity concerning the place for fundamental hermeneutics in this phenomenology. Whether it can be claimed that Marianne maintains the role for such a hermeneutics depends upon the point of view one approaches this phenomenology. Starting from lived experience, the finitude of the self necessitates the always already interpreted phenomenon. If one begins with the logical priority of givenness, however, arrived at through deploying the reduction, then hermeneutics is always late and secondary to the facticity of the original given. Another issue concerns the role of the self. Is the self who receives the given and converts it into manifestation purely passive, as has been argued? Interpretation as a dialogical activity operates between the interpreted, whether the text, the other, the event, etc., and interpreters who bring with them their horizons of understanding. The interpreter is described by Marianne as the one who, through its resistance to the given, fixes the limit for what converts into manifestation, functioning like the filament of a light bulb. It's at this point Marianne turns to Gadamer's fusion of horizons. That fusion emerges from an originary dialogue between two horizons, that of the given, such as the text, and that of the interpreter. The given poses a question to the interpreter, who in turn gives an answer, a signification. Marianne transposes this question-answer structure onto his own terminology of call and response. However, an ambiguity does enter here when Marianne argues that meaning comes from the given and not the interpreter. The role of the interpreter then is not to impose a meaning onto the given, to make the given conform to the whims of the interpreter. The act of interpretation is to be a response to the given, not invented whole cloth or made to fit within a universal solution. Marianne equates that kind of 
perfectly active hermeneutics with ideology, which dominates the given through a pure act of the will to power. Rather, interpretation is a matter of finding the meaning proper to the given by letting it unfurl its own meaning. Consequently, the authority of interpretation is shifted over to the interpreted phenomenon, and the interpreter functions as a servant and discoverer more so than an author and owner. The interpreter's main task is to recognize the meaning the given gives to itself. Doing so requires that the interpreters not only efface themselves, but also decide whether and how much resistance to put up. This conceptualization of the self's role in hermeneutics doubtlessly will not satisfy those concerned with the degree of passivity attributed to this self. It also opens new questions. Is there a middle ground between the perfectly active hermeneutics of ideology and this hermeneutics of self-effacement? Does the question, answer, or call response structure always go unilaterally? And if it is always unilateral, as it seems to have been presented in this essay, is it still correct to deploy Gadamer's metaphor of a fusion conveying a sense of symmetrical interaction when perhaps it's more apt to call it a desymmetrical filtration or even malleation? Many of these difficulties are mitigated once we more carefully consider what is meant by the claim that the given delivers its own signification and what's meant by the notion of resistance. The signification offered by the given is never univocal. There always remains a reserve of rationality and intelligibility still to come. Givenness simultaneously delivers signification and difference. The given maintains a kind of radical alterity that resists certain interpretations, makes possible other interpretations, and always keeps on reserve elements of the latter. As such, the given can never be comprehensively comprehended. What allows some of that vast reserve to make an appearance as the interpreted phenomenon is the resistance offered by the recipient or interpreter. However, this is not an inert, unchanging, and formless resistance as may be suggested by the metaphor of the filament. Earlier metaphors deployed by Marianne, such as the prism and soccer goalie, perhaps communicate a greater degree of dynamism in the activity of resistance. The prism does not simply reflect back exactly what was given to it, but actively disperses white light into its constituent spectrum of colors. And rather than produce the same result every time, light is dispersed differently depending upon the material and angle of the prism. This dynamism is perhaps even better demonstrated in the example of the soccer goalie, who does not simply await the ball to come, but readies himself by mastering skills, learning to cover angles, and reading opponents. Those skills in the athletic arena can be analogous with those conditioned horizons of the finite self who receives the given. Resistance then entails contact between the given and one's available and cultivated concepts, prejudices, traditions, and language. That point of contact is where the phenomenon is manifested. Consequently, such a phenomenology leaves intact much of what falls under the name of fundamental hermeneutics. However, it pays special attention not merely to the activity of interpretation itself and the ontological conditions of finitude that necessitate it. Rather, it attends to the fact that we find an interpretive phenomenon haloed with a border of conceptual imprecision that doubtless will never fade. Thought must always locate its source in the unthought, from which it receives its glory. Understanding is understood only against the backdrop of the non-comprehended, just as seeing requires the unseen and hearing the unheard. The unbidden comings and goings of the given, along with the ruptures and failures of our imminent horizons in comprehending it, all point to an essential lateness of interpretation that necessitates a moment logically prior to hermeneutics, even should it only be arrived at through the hermeneutic gesture always already enacted in lived experience. Marian finishes his essay identifying the gap between giving and showing whereby both the reduction and hermeneutics intervenes. One moves from the showing to the giving by deploying the reduction which measures this gap. The reduction assesses the gap by leading one from the showing to its unseen arrival, measuring in the effects upon the gifted the types and intensities of its radical contingency. 
such as whether it arrives, comes upon me, or imposes itself. Now, Marianne, in his most recent work, D'ailleurs, La Révélation, differentiates the effects of saturated phenomena from common phenomena by the manner in which some phenomena matter to me more than others, and so rise above the habitual commonality by becoming unforgettable. They do so in arriving not of my own volition, but in suddenly becoming readily accessible to me. Il se révèle lui-même accessible, simple, évident, manifeste. In opening new spaces, un autre espace, new times, en temps absolument nouveau, new communities, je me révèle à d'autres partenaires. And even revealing a new me to myself, me révèle à moi-même. We might add to this the effect of the affect and moods. Effects such as bedazzlement, surprise, desire, and guilt can all suggest a given received that overflows what shows itself. In contrast, vanity, boredom, disappointment, and contempt suggest a showing that may be equivalent to the received given. In turn, hermeneutics measures the possibility of converting the given into showing through its successes and failures at delivering a signification to the given. There are four moments of hermeneutics in particular. There is one interpreting the degree of a givenness, poor, common, uh, saturated, and all the gradations in between. Two, deploying endless interpretations of the saturated phenomenon. And three, the conversion of objects into events and events into objects. The fourth moment, the first described in the essay, concerns a hermeneutics of the call delivered through the counterintentionality of a saturated phenomenon. Interpretation determines whether the call is heard, deeming if it is assigned to the interpreter, and identifying who is calling. This hermeneutical moment connects to the second major critique level that this phenomenology of givenness. The accusation that, despite being proposed as a genuine philosophical position, it is in fact a disguised theology. This is because the call, though presented as essentially anonymous and dependent upon interpretation, is suspected to belie a divine caller or giver through whom originates all givenness. This suspicion is furthered by the selection of exemplars and models provided for this phenomenology, as well as the choice of terminology itself, givenness, gift, giver, call, revelation, etc. To the degree that's accurate, this suspicion would demonstrate a notable internal inconsistency in Marianne's philosophical approach. This criticism is delivered not only by those demanding a phenomenology untainted by theology, but also by those wishing to see the alleged religious or theological dimension be more fully embraced. In standing Lervatus pro Deo, masked before God, Falk argues that Marianne deprives his thought of what constitutes its potency and its true meaning. Carney, on the other hand, argues that the inclusion of religious concepts is too undetermined and allows for little hermeneutical discernment that can tell the difference between the divine and its opposite. Others direct their criticism at the perceived narrow theological orientation employed rather than the use of theology or religion per se, leading Marianne's approach to be sensationally labeled as a terroristic hermeneutics or as colonizing. It is asked why, among all the rich examples available across different religions and traditions, he only draws from a distinct version of the Christian tradition. However, in response to that question, I would pose a counter question, which is, what would the alternative be? Had Marianne attempted to be more inclusive by drawing from other religious traditions, would he not be guilty of, or, or at least accused of, cultural appropriation? Indeed, is it not less colonizing to draw from the religious tradition one knows and is committed to, rather than, as many writers do, feign inclusivity through a supposed dispassionate selection across traditions? If phenomenology begins with the interpreted, in this case the concrete manifestation of religious phenomena, is one not obliged then to work within a genuinely thick particularity? And rather than exclude, does this not call for others to do the same, to test the conclusions drawn from such phenomenological analyses? This line of questioning, however, does open up to another and perhaps more pressing concern, alleging that the concepts deployed in this phenomenology of givenness are inherently dependent upon such religious particularity. 
This marks the so-called theological turn of phenomenology, encapsulated by Jonico's declaration that phenomenology has been taken hostage by a theology that does not want to say its name. Such a critique is leveled at a philosophical attitude beginning with Levinas' totality and infinity, though the late Heidegger is implicated as well. And this philosophy imposes nothing less than the god of the biblical tradition. Notably, Jonico's criticism of Marian's phenomenology is directed not at the theological as such, but at certain of its translations into the phenomenological field. In particular, it is Marian's third reduction, identified as the pure call in reduction and givenness, that provokes Jonico's suspicion of a theological veering. Jonico provides another response to Marian's more fleshed out phenomenology of givenness, uh, which was published a year following being given. Nonetheless, his suspicions remain unabated, claiming that, for example, Marion leaves behind the methodological neutrality which he otherwise lays claim to. While Jonico overtly denies that he's contesting the possibility of a phenomenology of religion or even religious phenomena, he does contest the concepts incorporated by Marion, which are themselves, he thinks, inherently dependent upon a revelation rather than find them, their legitimacy within phenomenology. Indeed, such talk about gifts, givenness, and calling draw semantic resonances with certain theological themes. This claim is further supported by pointing toward the profound convergences between Marian's phenomenological works and his so-called theological works, such as idol and distance and God without being. However, such concepts have also been deployed by philosophers and other scholars who are not commonly suspected of similar theological imputations the call being a central concept in both the earlier and late Heidegger, the gift being a source of anthropological analysis by the likes of Levi-Strauss, Moss, and Bataille. One can also take another approach here and argue that if one is to accuse Marian of appropriating theological language in philosophical discourse, one could at the same time have to may have to condemn a significant portion of the phenomenological tradition and even beyond. It's even been argued that phenomenology was always already a theological enterprise. As one example, the concept of intentionality, deriving from the medieval Latin intensio, originated as a technical concept employed by scholastic philosophers and even as far back as Augustine, who in Book 11 of De Trinitat identifies intention with the will and analogizes it to the Holy Spirit in that it mediates between mind and object just as the Spirit mediates between the Father and the Son. Few within the phenomenological tradition would argue that the term, whether or not theologically inspired, is somehow undermined due to its possible theological roots. So to establish the validity of Jordico's critique would require more than mere language or even explicit borrowing. It would have to show that the argument itself necessitates the reader having faith in an actual revelation or a set of religious doctrines in order to accept these concepts. Yet, in being given and elsewhere, we we find what are offered explicitly phenomenological criteria. Even the concept of revelation as a possibility is based on the idea that saturated phenomena, each established based on phenomenological criteria, may be combined in various manners to push saturation to a maximum possible intensity. One doesn't have to accept the illustrations deployed to find the concept's justifications. Indeed, his most recent work pushes the concept of revelation beyond its purely religious connotations, applying the concept of revelation to the experience of love and even athletics. So rather than raise a, an unfalsifiable claim of secret theological imputations, through a kind of hermeneutics of suspicion, it's perhaps best to address this phenomenology on the level it professes to operate and ask whether the criteria offered adequately justifies the distinct concepts and developments made. And to Jonico's credit, he does exactly this in his essay, despite superimposing upon these arguments accusations of a theological motivation. Those arguments legitimately focus on the relationship between metaphysics and phenomenology, the interpretation of Husserl's Gegebenheit and its linking to Heidegger's Geben. Addressing these critiques and their merits would require an in-depth consideration of Husserl, Heidegger, and the general field of phenomenology, which would 
take us far afield uh, from the central purpose of present work. But there is another path forward. A phenomenology may be best measured not necessarily by its orthodoxy, nor by the supposed origins of the concepts it employs, but by the fruits of its labors. Does it allow us to access new phenomena that were previously hidden to us? Does it clarify something about the phenomena that we currently study that was not previously elucidated by other approaches? And does it show the fly the way out of the fly bottle by dissolving some of the bewitching philosophical problems that have plagued this phenomenon? These are the questions that I'll revisit um, when it comes to the conclusion of this work. In concluding this chapter, I wish to call attention to some unacknowledged or underdeveloped possibilities that I have identified with this phenomenology. First, there is a lack of attention to the role of preparatory practices in developing the capacity to receive phenomena. This is not merely a practical concern, but speaks to the more general hermeneutical ambiguities that persist in the role of the gifted and how one moves between degrees of givenness. Second, and more closely related to my project, is the lack of attention to the ambiguities concerning the status of poor phenomena, which are not so straightforward as to be completely identified with formal and categorical intuitions. Steinbach delineates four kinds of poor phenomena, beginning with the poor phenomenon proper, the humble phenomenon, the denigrated phenomenon, and pride as the poverty of the gifted. The last two are of particular interest here. The denigrated phenomenon appears when the saturated phenomenon is deprived of its ability to reveal. The poverty of pride is the refusal to receive what is given. It's not merely a matter of finitude, but rather a clinging to the self, a refusal of self-denial that impoverishes the receiver. This insightful examination of poor phenomena opens an entire field of inquiry yet to be fully considered. First, we may add to these four a fifth possibility, the denigrated phenomenon, exemplified by death, the nothing, and desire. These phenomena complicate the relation between poor and saturated phenomena, particularly to the degree that saturation concerns intuition. These phenomena are characterized by an absence of intuition and yet deliver what may be considered an excess of givenness. Death, in particular, is ambiguous as it, it has been used as an example of denigrated givenness, and also later identified as an example of the event, which is a saturated phenomenon. Another question is whether the denigrated phenomenon, rather than the denigrated phenomenon, which does not reveal all that is given, is always a matter of decision and capacity of the gifted to resist. Perhaps, as will be argued, some phenomena give themselves in such a way as to foreclose upon their own excess, or to foreclose upon the excess of future phenomena. Could the fruits of certain givens deliver a poison in their effects upon the one who receives them? Can there be an exception to saturated phenomena that delivers a call, but manifests as deafness? And what would the implications be for the gifted? In offering itself to givenness, the gifted receives itself in receiving the given. An implied assumption here is that givenness always gives by addition and not by subtraction, especially when it comes to the saturated phenomenon. Does the reception of every saturated given always individualize me, or can my singularity be abrogated by some phenomena, including those that are saturated? Perhaps receiving a given and serving as the site of its unfolding does not always necessitate the gift receiving itself at the same time, or at least not receiving what would expand horizons, deliver a widened spatiality, temporality, and identity. These questions do not so much amount to a critique, but a recognition that a philosopher's particular focus, even if the originator, does not exhaust the possibilities of that philosophy. The light of givenness, illuminated through the open window, reveals life, but also is a sufficient light for recognizing at once the authority of death. What follows in this series seeks to extend paths already opened by this phenomenology, allowing its light to shine on what has thus far been left at its margins, even what seeks to obscure that very light which illuminates it. What we'll find are phenomena encircled not by a halo, but instead by a penumbra. What mode of givenness is fitting for such a phenomenon? Is it saturated or denigrated givenness? 
Can this phenomenology be neatly partitioned between an excess and deficit, or are there some phenomena that reside in a field that blends them? As will be described, those phenomena given as an excess that attenuate, diminish, and divide, leaving the self impoverished, are named thanatonic phenomena, and their mode of givenness will be ascribed as parasitic. And so in the next videos, we're actually going to go into this notion of a parasitic givenness. First, by exploring whether something like that is already inherent in Marion's works, and then moving from there to suggest some areas of development. As always, thank you for watching, and I look forward to being with you again next time.